Well, hey everyone, it is me, Adrian Lee, the Wandering Art Historian. Thank you so much for coming back for yet another video. Um, I think at this point you know that we're in the midst of a brand new web series known as How to Read a Movie. Hopefully you've been enjoying our videos. Um, I'm having a lot of fun and I think cinema is art, so why not mash it up? If this title sounds familiar to you, which hopefully it does, um, it's probably because it's inspired by this web series I did months and months ago called How to Read a Painting. Do you remember that? It was like 15 videos where we talked about colors, symbols, and stories in famous works of art. And we looked at a lot of art. We talked about a lot of color symbols and stories. And we noticed that a lot of artists use color symbols and stories as a way of like placing clues into the paintings to help us, the viewers, unlock the meanings of those paintings. Well, guess what? We're gonna apply those same principles to cinema, your favorite films. I mean, it seems like the perfect mashup, right? So uh, I'm sure you've picked up on our very different environment and format and the fact that I've been using the word we, that's because these aren't lecture videos, these are actually conversation videos. So for every film, I've asked a guest in a file to join me in a discussion on analyzing the color symbols and stories of said film. So let us meet our guest cinephile um, for this video, Sharice McCulley. Hey, Sharice, how's it going? Woo, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm very I'm, excited. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here. We're gonna have the best time because we love this movie. Let's learn a little bit more about Sharice, shall we? Sharice McCulley, um, her favorite or preferred film genre is horror and dark comedy. And that's going to play a big role in today's discussion. Um, three films that best describe her cinematic tastes are Heather's, Hereditary, and Fargo. Oh, chef's kiss mm. to that trio. And the film everyone loves but she hates is Prometheus. And to that I say, you're here. Um, what's our film? Uh, let's reveal it to everyone. The incredible, already classic film Midsummer by Ari Aster, released in 2019. I'm going to come out and say it. I love Ari Aster. This dude freaks me out, and I love it. I think he creates art. I think um, he's a genius. And personally, to me, he's the one picking up the mantle held previously by Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, I know. Just leave your comments in the video below. I'll hear about it later. Um, but before we go any further, just a little spoiler alert. If you have not yet seen Midsummer, please pause this video, go watch it, and then come right back because nothing's off the table. We're going to talk about characters, we're going to talk about plot point, and we are definitely going to give away the ending. So if you want to be surprised by this film, please go watch it real quick. Also, just as a quick heads up, um, this film contains multiple challenging images, things that some people might find disturbing relating to mental health issues, relating to suicide, relating to murder, relating to human sacrifice. And if that makes you still want to watch it, then go for it. You're all set. So let's dive in to Midsummer. Let's start by talking about the role color place. Ari Aster is a master when it comes to the use of color in his films. And this is only his sophomore outing, by the way, just a heads up. Um, Sharice, you mentioned something to me that like caught me off guard. And when I rewatched Midsummer, I realized how right you were and how ridiculous I was to forget this. You mentioned that this film starts with a pop of color and it also ends with a pop of color. And that's what we've got here on the screen. I remembered it as starting with this wintry scene of like where our main characters live, but I forgot that right before that is revealed this amazing painting 
is on the screen and then it splits like a curtain opening almost yeah. reveal where they're living why what what's going on with this yeah um it's almost like he is trying to uh give us a taste of this warm and colorful world and we can't really see you know exactly what's going on in the there's four panels uh, to this it's it, we're not really honing in on the details we might be trying to but it's kind of hard to see them we're just getting like the overall idea of warmth and color and then it kind of slides back like shutter doors and we're just like thrown directly into this cold gray monotone world almost like uh yeah you'd think that place looks nice and warm yet yeah. well you're not going there yet this is the harsh reality <laughs> of where we are Excellent. um right Not that harsh reality thing because when yeah. you think about their life like it's, hmm. ever i don't think they ever say out loud where they are but no it's, idea it's a dark monotone shadowy mm -hmm. place probably chicago no i don't know are there mountains in chicago probably not I don't know. Either way, it's yeah. freezing. Like, I yeah. feel physically cold. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> the pictures that are on the wall in, the, in this restaurant uh, that Christian's in, in the bottom there, there's so many pictures on the wall of that restaurant. Every single one of them is black and white or some kind of sepia tone. Like, okay we get it there's no color here well we get it um and also something i noticed the other day and i don't have a slide for it but uh when danny is communicating with her sister via email i assume it is even their profile pictures are in black and white uh, every little small detail how much yeah. do you love that i love it when a director pays such close attention to those details because it kind of acknowledges us, the viewer, yeah. that we're going to pick up even on those little things. Like yeah. you said, the fact, because you're absolutely right now that I'm thinking about it, that whole scene where they're in the pizza parlor and he's mm. getting that call from Danny, as they zoom out, the big painting behind or the big photograph behind him is in black and white. Mm. So yeah. He's just really driving home. Which is why at the very end, when you end with this image of Danny in like vivid technicolor, like she's covered head to toe mm -hmm. in these flowers, it's still kind of shocking, right? It's like right? <sighs> Yes. And it's uh it's in that that opening panel somewhere there too. I'm sure her her crown, you know, is May Queen and covered in flowers. And don't tell Ari Aster, but um I did bump up the saturation on this a little bit before I sent it to you and turned on the brightness. Shh, don't tell. I won't tell. Honestly, okay, good. I think he would like to go with that. I think he you would. Know, he might be like, oh, you know, I see the value in that now. I'm sure. <laughs> so what's interesting about this stark contrast is the yeah. fact that, yeah, it's very vivid in color, but like you said, with Ari Aster and the details, Mm -hmm. We did pick up on some things, and you pointed mm -hmm. it out, is the color yellow seems to play a very interesting role in this film, and even in yeah. tiny details. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on the color yellow, Sharice? So, I mean, yellow, just, I rewatched your, uh, your other series, your How to Read a Painting. Uh, I rewatched the, the color yellow video, which is amazing, by the way. Um, and I forgot, um, I forgot how versatile yellow can be, especially depending on which, you know, which culture. And I, I'm sure that the color yellow in Sweden is even a whole, adds a whole other layer to it that I have yet to research. But, you know, the, the, where he gives her the cake, even just that, uh, yellow can represent betrayal, right? So I thought that was an interesting little tidbit that might be me imposing my own thing onto it. But uh, he's forgotten her birthday and he, you know, haphazardly has scrounged up a slice of cake from some, some oven somewhere. <laughs> and it's like, here, he, here's a little 
taste of my betrayal. Just a little taste. You're going to get a big one later. I, for now, it's just a little slice of cake. That is freaking spot on brilliant because the whole time, like, and the great thing about the idea that it's a, an act of betrayal, it's mm -hmm. kind of like this feeling like if it had been anybody else, we would have thought, yeah. oh, that's such a sweet thing to do. But yeah. at this point, even us, the viewer, we know that Christian has completely forgotten her birthday. Yes. You know, and we're like, oh, it's almost like too little, too late. Mm -hmm. Guy, like, yeah, uh, I'm. I have celiac disease too. So great. Thanks for the. Thanks for the inflammation. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. Um, just uh, to keep going with this idea of the symbolism and the colors. I noticed that while yellow dominates this film, mm -hmm. there are moments where we kind of round things out with the primary colors and it's so subtle, but it's so profound when it happens. Like the color blue pops up um, kind of in reference to death almost because um, mm -hmm. as all of you know, because you, you paused the video and you went to watch Midsummer and you came back, so this is not a spoiler. <laughs> Um, these two individuals participate um, in a cultural, um, old school, if you, or old world is probably the better way to say it, um, act of human sacrifice, and they are dressed completely in blue, and they wear, or they sit in the blue chairs, and their attendants who come after this dinner scene are all dressed in blue and carry them to the site. So I thought, holy yikes. And blue, like, is kind of a sacred color anyway. Mm -hmm. So very interesting. Um, and the color red, good job, Ari Aster, for saving it for those really special moments. Maya's character, yes, she has red hair. But at the mm -hmm. end of the film, she has had sex with Christian. Mm -hmm. He has ultimately betrayed uh, Danny on multiple levels. She not only wears a red um, addition to her dress, but her lips, she is wearing bright red lipstick. Like she is not holding back. And then mm -hmm. as part of the sacrifice that we've just mentioned, the human sacrifice, um, the, the, the peeps, they just cut their, their hands are cut and they sh put the blood on the rings. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, yikes. So that little, um, nothing bad could happen after that, right? No, no, no. Oh, Everything gosh. is. I think they're going to a birthday party after this. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, good job, Ari Aster, on the combination of the primary colors. Yes. Another thing I wanted to say about yellow. I'm sorry if no. I could. And um, the so you know. This is Simon, and he's deceased, I think we can assume, even though his lung or his the, the meat of his back is still moving. I think that's just illustrating the, the psychedelic effects of the drugs that Christian is on. But with this yellow in his eyes, this burst of yellow, and then there's also a scene when Danny has a nightmare about her sister, um, the yellow of the, first off, the hose, that she is taped to her mouth and also the yellow of her shirt. I mean, there's so much going on, but the, the yellow in the shirt almost can indicate um, disease. You know, yellow can symbolize disease sometimes, right? Sure. And so it's almost like maybe that's representing her, her mental state. Um, and then I also wrote down a quote from, uh, it was a Kandinsky quote that you had called out in your video about yellow and it to me when you're looking at that picture of of terry with the hose coming out of her mouth and her her parents lying dead next to her um i mean he says a lot about the color yellow kandinsky but this these three words i wrote down that i think are just particularly striking yes when you when you come to that one is um let me get that yeah there we go Okay. Um, violent, raving lunacy. I mean, I think that you, if this were a painting, that's what you could probably title it. Violent, raving 
lunacy. Not to say, you know. No, I totally get you. Because honestly, if you think about this, what this, this is such a profound image from the yeah. film because this isn't what happened in real life. This is right. actually Danny's brain processing what she just saw with those yeah. two older folks com committing suicide as part of a mm -hmm. sacrifice, remember? Because they were in blue. Yeah. In her mind, she has transposed her parents into those roles and she has put her sister clearly wearing yellow with the yellow tubing that yeah. she i gotta say that's a rough choice of suicide method like yeah could you yeah could you have been more creative no no right think, so yeah i think that's a, a brilliant yeah. observation uh we you mentioned something about because you almost got it like there's this feeling of like the number three here because of the mm -hmm. parents and the her sister but you also because of the idea of three you mentioned something about triangles mm -hmm. all over this film and of course you know you can watch a movie a bunch of times and it's only when you sit down to take notes that you're like <gasps> like things jump out at you because I've seen yeah. I've seen this film like four times now and every, when I sat down to take notes it's like wow um, yeah. you're not wrong like there are and the triangles are also yellow like mm, right. this one building is like constantly in the background a Pele says you're not allowed to go in there it's like a secret mm. thing it's a secret building but you're not allowed to go in there and it's so ominous and it's yeah. so creepy and mm. you know, it doesn't necessarily feel creepy but the way it's used, what do you think? Yeah. Um, my goodness. Well, I mean, we can talk about the triangle uh, and we can also even talk about the yellow, uh, the bright yellow of this building. So triangles are all over the place in this movie. <clears throat> and I don't know if you noticed, but um, even in Terry's bedroom at the beginning when there's the camera slowly pans in, triangles are everywhere oh my the, gosh. yeah there's there's some kind of curtain thing that's on her wall and it doesn't cover a window I don't know why it's there but that has kind of another random pattern on it but on her actual walls the wallpaper pattern that's on her actual walls is the kind of the, sh the shape of this building <gasps> yeah no. mm -hmm. and there's they're almost like ma are they, yeah, they kind of look like mountains on the on the pattern you don't know what it is but it's um yeah, and there are various, you know, various buildings or mountains or whatever of various sizes. And then there's a triangle pattern on her, the curtains that do cover the window. <clears throat> so there's that. There's um, the triangle of this building. There's the triangles, uh, the triangle that is, yeah, the threshold of where they come in. Um, I, I think that he's using the shape uh, as symbolism for like uh gateways gateways to various things um so obviously this is a very literal gateway you know kind of a threshold to where they step into it um also yellow and this kind of i mean this just seems like it's a gateway to you know your death. oh my gosh i never the afterlife you just made my brain melt because I think you're absolutely right. Because think about it, um, it's like a transition point, you know? Mm. The the outsiders, the new blood, enter this community, Horga, through this threshold. And the people who um, are members of this community who go out, they have to come back to this. So it's almost like a transition point, right? A yeah. gateway, if you will. Yeah. And this ominous thing, I mean, the fact that they light it on fire filled with nine human bodies, um, mm. just, yeah. it's to ensure that, hey, we keep going, the community keeps going. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what we've done for centuries. You definitely get a feeling of this is a, like an old world yeah. Viking. I mean, who yeah. knows? Kind of thing right 
Mm -hmm. And um, I love the idea of transitions and gateways um, to enter mm -hmm. the afterlife for sure, for sure. And if, and if you want to pull up, if you want to just refer back to the um, slide of Terry at the foot of the cliff, um, you ready for this? Okay. Hit me. Pre <laughs> pretend that you are on top of the cliff looking down at this. What shape do you see? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. You how yeah. oh uh, yeah 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 um and it's also that you know there's a round stump that terry's leaning against um it's like that's obviously a sphere inside of a triangle and you see a lot of shapes within other shapes in this it's, i i might lack the brain power to get into that shapes within shapes okay i'm just trying to wrap my brain around the triangle right now as so, as you're speaking about shapes within shapes, I can't help but go back yeah. to the gate, the threshold. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Circle yeah. and something. yeah, yeah. Um, circle gets the square. Circle gets no. the square. Um. The excellent observation. Um, the fact that you picked up on that, I think, would make Ari Aster like uh, want to follow you on Instagram. The excellent of that would be like. I hope so. Awesome. Um, I hope so. Just gonna point out too that mm -hmm. uh, even the shape in which Harry is kind of leaning against mm -hmm. this is very pyramidal or mm -hmm. pyramid so in the shape of a pyramid. Ooh, right? Yeah, and the knees mm -hmm. very much like a pieta, you know, where it's the Virgin Mary as she cradles the dead Christ oh, wow. after he has been removed from the cross. But there is no other figure. She is alone. In a fact, wow. and in this sense, almost like a, a sacrifice to her mental illness or what have you. She brought her parents with her yeah. on this. Oh, goodness. Um, and, so, uh, I'm so yeah. sorry. No, but we're um, it's also interesting that uh, the in this particular, in, in Danny's nightmare, the hose that's coming out of Terry's mouth is very serpent-like. It's in a very snake shape, whereas uh, it wasn't really in the in the home. It kind of just snaked through very, you know, in very right angles throughout the house. That this is coiled up, almost snake-like. And I wanted to pick your brain about that. You know, that's a that's a really cool observation. I mean, snakes. I mean, and uh, Christian iconography are definitely associated with the devil, with Satan, yeah. as a representation mm -hmm. because they refer to uh satan in the garden of good uh, of eden you know climbing mm -hmm. that tree the tree of the knowledge of good and evil yeah. um and, and he um tempts eve with this fruit that is supposed to give them knowledge and yeah. she eats it and hands it over to adam and i don't know i mean is maybe there's a connection to the idea that the snake tempted Terry and that she gave in. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but and you then have all kinds of roads with that, I think. Thank you. And then another question is, um, in, you know, thinking about yellow uh, in reference to disease, representing disease or death, is the snake, you know, the snake, the hose, uh, yeah. is it, is the disease, is it, climbing in is it going into or coming out from her her is this her way of getting rid of her disease and is it Go reaching toward it's it's reaching towards the front of the camera which is danny's perspective even in her nightmare is it is it reaching out for danny that i, I don't know i love it i don't know i love that it's almost a level of surrealism, right? Because mm -hmm. we're playing with things that happen in the real world and trying to find their deeper meanings. And I love that because then again, that's Ari Aster saying, I know that whoever watches this movie, they're gonna bring their stuff to this film, which means this movie is gonna mean something completely different for each person who watches it. Yeah, And we're yeah. gonna connect with all different things. And I love that. It just hit me as you were asking about the idea of breathing and the illness. Do you yeah. know this, that Ari Aster includes 
an audio cue in his films, like in Hereditary, we hear the, the clicking, the like that yeah. kind of clicking sound. And mm -hmm. in Midsummer, they do the breath, right? Where they mm. go like that. Mm. And no, very wonderful. when um, Danny blows out the candle that we see with the color mm. yellow that Christian gives her, and it's like she just takes a deep breath and goes yeah. like that. But that idea of breathing in, because remember when she's about mm. to start the, the May Queen dance? Yeah, she does. That. They tell her to do that. So. Oh and, my God. So, and that means her sister would have to breathe in that poison. Oh my God. Well, but she can't breathe it back out. Like, it's so it's, I don't know. Oh, there's so, literally, you could, you could teach a class at a college on any scene in this movie. You can teach Hands on all the things. Hands down. Um, yeah. So we should do that. I don't know how, but we can uh, we'll figure, we'll it figure it out. We're smart ladies. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Smart. Um, so let's talk a little bit about repeated stories because Midsummer is a very unique story in that sure, it pulls from different cultures uh, Sweden, it's where it's supposed to take place. And if you think about medieval cultures or Vikings and their practices and what have you, so there are elements of things that have happened in the past. However, what we see in art in particular with paintings is some artists like to paint the same story over and over again. We see Judith slaying Holofernes, we see the nativity, we see the birth of Venus and stuff like that. So I think that definitely translates to film and cinema. And I know this is going to sound crazy, but in some research, someone mentioned a connection to The Wizard of Oz with this particular mm. film. And now I'm just a teeny tiny little bit obsessed with connecting Ari Aster's Midsummer to the film A Wizard of Oz, okay? And hear me I love out it. i mean it's probably just me but if you think about it danny is our female protagonist she's like our dorothy character mm -hmm. and her whole t the whole movie she's trying to get home let's face it let's call it what it is she's trying right. to find her home right her yes. real family yes. she's on this journey with three companions that are dudes i mean take that as you will <laughs> Um, as they approach Horga, the the trail is covered in yellow flowers. That's like the yellow brick road. I know. Oh my goodness. I know it's a stretch, but wow. Um, no. There are references to scarecrows throughout this movie. One of the really blatant ones, and I know this is a very dark image, but if you look on the top of this refrigerator, it's a picture of the scarecrow from The Wizard of Oz. Oh my god. Um, so it's kind of like, huh, that seems pretty nice. Um, Christian ends up inside a bear. Mm -hmm. Of course, this should not surprise you because you paused the video and you went to go see Midsummer. Um, so I don't know if that's like a cowardly lion reference. I mean, Christian is not a great guy and he is a bit of a coward and he does yeah. betray her. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, but even just the fact that it goes from this monotone, dark color scheme to, as we said, technicolor, even that mm -hmm. feels like a little bit of Dorothy going from Kansas to Oz. Um, so, I mean, that's just, you know, one, like we said, we could teach a whole class just on this film, but yeah. you and I were talking and you mentioned the idea of the hero's journey and that mm. has been embedded in my brain. So mm. I was trying to look for it. Do you want to explain a little bit about what the hero's journey is or the point? Yeah. So the hero's journey, uh, I think that's what, you know, Joseph Campbell referred to it as. I think the idea has kind of been around a little bit before him, but he, I, I think, sort of brought in a little Jungian psychology and the archetypes into his, you know, um, re-exploration of the hero's journey idea. So it's just the idea that a you know, the oldest story, one of the oldest stories in the book, a hero leaps home and journeys to a magical land where he 
slay the dragon and returns home with, you know, transformed in some way. So uh, Danny definitely goes through a hero's journey. And uh, I mean, she hits like every single one of those steps. Um, you know, they're not in exact order if you look at the, the hero's journey, but she does nonetheless hit them. Um, so these slides right here, this first one where she's talking to Pele on the couch, she's already decided to go to Sweden with Christian. And he's already invited her and she's just like, yeah, sure, whatever, I'll, I'll go too. Um, but it's really not like until she sees this, these photographs on his phone that he tempts her with that really sparks her interest. <clears throat> so you could consider this to be like her call to adventure, which is one of the first steps. Uh -huh. This is her call to adventure. Um, and he, Pele is kind of acting as uh, most heroes come in contact with a spiritual guardian somewhere along the way in their quest that uh, helps them in, in you know various ways. So you could kind of think, consider like Pele to be her spiritual guardian. Um, That's and even so great. Yeah. like I never thought about that before because when you watch, you can tell the way he interacts with the guys is very different like he is incredibly sympathetic to Danny he is very thoughtful mm -hmm. and Danny seems to accommodate everyone else but no one wants to accommodate her except yeah. for Pele so it does yes. act like he's trying to kind of watch out for her and protect her uh, yes. just an observation um and uh oh I'm so sorry oh um, in that other slide when just an interesting little tidbit um you know she's trying to there's another process called the refusal of the call that heroes go through so sometimes that happens before they you know get to the new world um Danny kind of refuses it or attempts to refuse it sort of the whole way but the spiritual guardian is there to keep them on the path and this is what he's doing here she's freaking out he, she's just witnessed the um at the stupa and she's freaking, but he's like, hey, 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 it's all good. Um, and another thing that sometimes happens is the spiritual guardian will present the hero with some sort of talisman or something. And in this scene, he tries to give her that little rock, like a smelling rock to, to calm her down. She doesn't take it, but uh, still very interesting. He, <clears throat> offering her things. He also offers her that, you know, that drawing that he did of her on her, for her birthday. Uh, so he's offering her things. So he's definitely Danny's uh, spirit, spirit guardian. That is so wild because as you're explaining it, it's almost the exact dialogue. Like their mm -hmm. conversation, she's like, why am I here? I'm not an anthropologist. These right. other guys want to study the place. And he yeah. even says, you were the one I was most excited yeah. about to come to my community. Yeah. Holy smokes. I know. Awesome. Awesome. I love, love Pele. Uh, we got some, I did warn everybody <laughs> about some disturbing images. Yeah. These aren't too, too bad, but no. Danny has this really terrifying dream while yeah. she's in the village with them. Yeah. So you could consider um, this nightmare of hers to be part of her trial that the hero uh, goes under um i think you could you could refer to it as the road of trials i mean she's she's kind of on that road the entire film really but yeah this could be uh one of those things where her deepest darkest fear is you know coming out in her dream um she's been abandoned by her family and christian as far as we know as far as we can tell christian is the last the last person that has not abandoned so that's her last final deepest darkest fear that he will and in this nightmare he's packed up in the middle of the night with the other guys and they're leaving her um so yeah that is uh that's one of just one of many trials you could think of the may queen trial as another trial oh. which she actually overcomes uh but then this other slide where she's you know witnessing christian with Maya and the whole the whole gang oh. that are in there, uh, the fun party, the fun party that she witnesses. 
oh sure um we met at a party yeah that's all awesome. yeah they didn't yeah but uh so you could consider this there's a step in the hero's journey called the final approach uh or approach to the innermost cave or the atonement with the father is what uh joseph campbell referred to it as it's kind of like a final confrontation um with the hero and either a dragon or some big monster that is supposed to represent the deepest darkest innermost spirit which is christian abandoning her and she you know witnesses it here so that's the final uh you know thing that she has to endure um and it's awful and and you're oh my gosh and and it's in a building that's dark like a cave would be like yeah. as you're saying yeah. this i'm connecting dots that i guess mm -hmm. were just below the surface or whatever so you're amazing and thank you oh, um you. but that holy building that they're in where this yeah. event is taking place with if i might say christian mm -hmm. dragon if you will oh yeah. Yeah. i'm gonna go there i'm gonna say oh. it. um <laughs> that is i the thing is i feel like Danny hears the, the chanting and the noise outside and the girls after her May Queen ceremony are like, that's not for us. And yeah. they do try to protect her. So yeah. there's part of me that thinks she knows what is going on, but yeah. has to see it with yeah. her eyeballs to do that yeah. final break. Yes. She, yeah, you can tell in her... Um as she approaches that door you can just see on her face she knows what she's gonna find she just has to yeah absolutely yeah. oh my mm -hmm. gosh and what we find out what happens after is kind of i mean it's heartbreaking and sad we have this mm -hmm. scene with her and her court if you think about it, she's been mm -hmm. the main queen and these are the girls that are her court how do we wrap up the hero's journey after something like that? Yeah, so the hero um, usually goes through some kind of transformation, um, either after the, the road of trials or after that final confrontation. Um, so she's definitely going through that here. Uh, when she's huddled down on the floor with the girls, that's kind of like the first part of her transformation. They're like taking on her pain uh, they're matching her her hyperventilating and yeah it's, it's there's a couple things going on here maybe they either are just trying to match her pain so that she feels held or they're trying to somehow take it from her oh I, don't I know. love that because yeah. and that would make sense because we we both talked about the fact that when she is experiencing the trauma of losing her sis, her entire family to murder suicide at the beginning, mm -hmm. she is wailing, mm -hmm. which makes perfect sense if you are experiencing trauma. And yeah. Christian is physically holding her, but he is making no sound and he is looking very aloof. Yeah. which is the exact opposite to this scene late in the film after she has witnessed the final betrayal of Christian, her, mm -hmm. her new family, they, like you said, they're matching her, her vocal um, expression mm -hmm. stuff, her pain. They're experiencing it with her. They are sharing the empathy. And just thinking back, don't they say we share everything in this community. We mm. all raise the babies. Uh, we all do yeah. this. We all take part. And this is them proving to Danny, like, hey, we get that you're going yeah. through this pain. So because it is your pain, it's now our pain too. So I love it. And you're so right. Um, when he, you know, Christian is holding her at the beginning, he, he's holding her kind of physically, half acidly on the couch. But all you can really see on his face is, oh, man, if only I had broken up with her a day earlier. Exactly. I wouldn't have to be doing oh, this. Yeah. You're so right. You're so yeah. right. He's not willing to go there for Danny, but these girls who are basically strangers to her are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, so, yeah. Amazing. Um, and then, you know, when she's uh, in her flower chair, in her flower, excuse me, 
your own. Oh, it's not a chair. It's not a chair. She oh. has won. She has won the Game of Thrones. She has okay. won the Game of Thrones. She won. She's. I mean, she's got her a crown on now. You know, it's not just a little, the little temporary May Queen hat that they that they put on her when she won. It's like a full on crown, covered in flowers, sitting in a flower chair, um, and she seems sort of despondent, but she's no longer in pain. Immediate, you know, suffering, it seems like. I think her transformation is more or less complete at this point. So this is kind of like the second phase of her transformation. I think, I think you're right. I think this is such an amazing film because it can mean so many things to so many different people. Like, yeah film that you can't really put into just one genre because yeah. if you were to just say well it's a horror film then you were like well it doesn't mm -hmm. abide by a lot of the horror tropes like the fact that it's midsummer so the days are long so almost the entire film takes place during the day like when yeah. the sun is shining and mm -hmm. there's color everywhere so that dismantles that trope and Danny yeah. even turns the idea of the final girl on its head because yeah she did outlive technically every person that was part of her that was going on that journey with her mm -hmm. um but it's more like she's not just the final girl she's a girl who is finally home you know yeah. so found home yes uh, yeah you could uh, consider this uh, last shot, this final shot of the movie as her finally allowing herself to feel home and finally realizing almost that she's home. Um, and there is a quote that I wrote down from Joseph Campbell. Um, I think it's from The Hero with a Thousand Faces where he kind of delves into the hero's journey. And within the quote, he is quoting uh, Ovid metamorphosis but I thought it was really and he this quote is in regards to that final stage in the hero's journey where they're home they've returned home and they're transformed into the new being that they are and I just thought with this particular shot of her finally allowing herself to smile really even I just thought this quote was particularly poignant so if you'll allow me to read it <clears throat> I love it. I love it. Nothing retains its own form, but nature, the great renewer, ever makes up forms from forms. Be sure that nothing perishes in the whole universe. It does but vary and renew its form. Thus, the next moment is permitted to come to pass. Whoa. Um, yeah. my, my brain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um i love it oh, and that almost makes danny's story the epitome of this midsummer festival because mm -hmm. like you said in that quote it's all about renewal right yeah like, okay right. this is how we start again and danny is literally starting again with mm -hmm. her new now. like yeah and what? they and the horga themselves almost seem to not even think about what they're doing is violent murder sacrificial you know oh. they they look at it as just the renew the re renewal of forms in the con the motion of the the constant turning of the cycle I, so not only it's like she's now in line with that thinking and um she's not fighting against that sort of thing anymore she yes. is just allowing the next moment that's perfectly that it. That's perfectly it. Because if you think about it, the fact that they're like, hey, yeah, we do a human sacrifice, and then we got these yeah. people the outside, the old bloods and the new bloods, and how it's mm. just routine and natural for them. That's such a good parallel with the idea of Christian in the bear suit, because that just proves, see, humans are just animals. We're just mm. part of this world. We're just part of this environment and this nature. It's it is what it is. Yeah. How we've been doing it for centuries, if not longer. And yeah. Danny's like, all right, cool. Yeah. Do it. All right. I'm in. I uh 
this guy was kind of a jerk anyway. Exactly. Let's, let's do this. Good riddance. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much, Therese. You no. are amazing. We could have talked about this for like hours. I mean, yeah. hours and hours, like you said. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to you and say thank you so much for being willing to talk and be part of this web series. Do you have anything you want to say as we wrap up this video to as a, as a parting comment to our viewers? Um, just stay out of the forest. Yeah. Just I mean, stay out of the forest. Or I'm, don't. Hey. If that's your thing. If that is your thing. Cherise, truer words were never spoken. Thank you so, so much for being a part of this. And thanks to all of you for being a part of How to Read a Movie. This web series has been so much fun. I hope you're having fun. Um, if you like this video, be sure to like the, the video itself. Be sure to leave your comments. Please, we wanna hear them. We love the comments. Definitely share this video with the other art historians and cinephiles in your life. And subscribe to the Wandering Art Historian YouTube channel for more videos like this. Again, thank you to our guest cinephile, Sharice McCauley, for discussing Midsummer. Thanks to all of you for watching. Again, my name is Adrian Lee. You know me as the Wandering Art Historian. I have been having so much fun with this, and I hope you are too. Until next time, I'll see you later.